maintain ecological balance. Coyotes can have a big impact on other species. They definitely eat, like I said, they, they definitely eat small mammals and rabbits, and they can have Im impacts on other carnivores. So they definitely have an important role in the ecosystem. While the coyote is important in nature's scheme of things, attempts to eradicate the species have had another surprising effect. More recent years, say the last 50 years or so, they've spread out to the Midwest and even to the East. Studies in national parks have shown the best ways to control coyote populations. Eradication of, of coyotes has been tried over and over in many different areas and has generally been very unsuccessful. And I think it's partly because, again, they're, they're very adaptable and they can, they can vary their reproductive rates. So if, they're, if a lot of animals are getting removed, then they produce a lot of animals. And so generally trying to wipe out coyotes has, has just not been effective. Since killing coyotes is not a solution to the problem, we must have a better understanding of their lifestyle. Coyotes tend to live in small family groups, made up mostly of parents and young pups. Some studies show that coyotes mate for life. Female coyotes are fertile for only one week during the year. Thus, most pups are generally born in late April or early May. It is while the pups are being raised that the coyote pack is busiest gathering food. Coyotes become especially active during the mid-spring through the late summer when they uh, have their litters and of course they need to raise these litters and food requirements go way up. Coyote litters are between six to eight pups. They will stay approximately six months with their parents, learning how to hunt for food and how to stay alive. The coyote is a predator and a very adaptable predator that will take advantage of any food source that it can get. What they do is they actually go throughout their range searching all the places where they found food before and uh, if it's dog food then that's what they're going to be searching out. If it's fruit they're going to be searching that out. If it's uh, garbage they're going to be going through their range checking every place that they've got uh, food before and then investigating new places. When the pups reach maturity the males will leave the pack and stake out their own hunting and living territory. The females will often stay to help raise the next litter. As a species, coyotes are amazingly successful, and there's no reason to think that, that that's going to change anytime soon. So, how do we deal with coyotes? What are the do's and don'ts of keeping our homes and pets safe from this persistent pest? If you're having trouble with animals raiding your trash cans, prevent the lid from uh, coming up. You can always strap it down with some type of bungee cord or, or similar type of thing. Also, you might be able to spritz a little bit of ammonia or something like that, something to make it unpleasant, cayenne pepper, anything that you feel might uh, cause an unpleasant smell or sensation to an animal that might be raiding your garbage. Okay, well here are our garbage cans as they are now, but we are going to uh, have them enclosed here with a fence. We're going to put a, a fence that will have two doors that will open up so they'll be completely enclosed. If you have fruit trees in and around your home, collect the fruit before or as soon as it falls to the ground. If you have a home garden, Keep it properly fenced. And use something stronger than chicken wire, because a coyote can chew right through it. Fences properly constructed are also a good deterrent against coyotes. A local professional fencing contractor can help with the specific enclosure needs of your home. Coyotes can scale a six to eight foot chain link fence with no problem. However, if you have an angled addition mounted at the top of the fence, of course check with your zoning to make sure that this is a legal thing to do. Uh, but most fence companies are familiar with uh, an angled addition that might make it more difficult for a coyote to, to jump over. Also, to prevent coyotes from digging under, um, you can extend a chain link apron in the dirt that extends out three to four feet. That will prevent them from digging under. And we have wrought iron fencing around the perimeter of the property. We then have another row of fencing going into the ground so the coyotes cannot dig under the ground. Another approach to fencing is the coyote roller designed to stop a coyote or any wild animal from jumping over your fence. Besides good fencing, there are other deterrents that can be effective against coyotes. Randomly blinking lights or water sprinklers that are activated by sound or movement can deter wildlife. Such things as motion sensor devices, and sprinkler devices, lights that come on at unexpected times. Some people hook motion sensor devices up to a radio station or a stereo or something. So um, if you get creative, you can uh, oftentimes uh, scare off a lot of these animals uh, before they become a real problem. 
The only word of caution to that is that uh, these animals do get used to just about everything. So if you don't change things up and change them often, you will quickly find yourself in the same position. But right now, for try to keep the coyotes off the property, we're putting in motion detectors on lights for the hillside. So if something comes by, the, the lights will go off and hopefully deter them. And uh, probably hook it up with some kind of a bell system so when the lights go off, a bell will go off and maybe scare them off. Never leave pet food sitting outside. Once your pets have eaten, bring eating and drinking bowls inside the house. Also, keep all pets inside the house or in an extremely secure enclosure. What we've decided to do is to stay with the dogs when we let them out. That's the major precaution we're taking. It won't solve the coyote problem, but it'll give my pets protection. When you are off your property, walk your pet with a leash. If your dog gives chase, the coyote will often lead the animal into a trap that can wound or kill your pet. I recommend that maybe you carry something such as a air horn or something similar, just protect yourself a little better. In general, when you encounter any what you consider threatening wildlife, it is always a bad idea to turn and run. That is often the trigger that causes the animal to um, attack when it might not otherwise. Um, should you see a, a coyote or a mountain lion or bobcat, you need to stand your ground and act threatening back. And that's not to say you need to chase the animal or run at it to scare it, but make yourself as large as possible. Speak in a low, loud tone and just make your presence known. Also, there are some important things you should not do. Never allow your pets to roam away from the house. They can easily fall prey to a coyote. Do not leave garbage containers open. Not only will it attract coyotes, but once it becomes a source of food, they will return to it again and again, regardless of how you secure it. Do not leave trash out for a number of days. Take the garbage out the night before, or early that morning for pickup. The most difficult, but most important thing not to do? Never feed a coyote. You endanger yourself, your children, and everyone in your community. Coyotes that lose their fear of people become bold and may attack children and grown-ups if they are not offered the food they have been accustomed to getting from others. Any animal that is fed by, by humans uh, loses their fear of people. Uh, when they lose their fear of people, they become a threat to uh, those individuals and other individuals around. It changes their behavior. Uh, it causes them to act in an unnatural way, viewing people as a, a way to get food rather than something to fear. In many instances, these animals uh, have to be removed for the public safety uh, simply because it's just too dangerous to have them there. The best defense against coyotes is to secure your home with the proper fencing and deterrent devices. Keep your pets indoors, or when outdoors, on a leash. Secure or store all possible food. And above all, never feed a coyote. If you need more information or are having a problem with coyotes, please call this number. Channel 35. Your city, your channel.
Good morning. Uh, this is the uh, Ad Hoc Committee on Economic Recovery and Reinvestment. This is a special meeting Friday, September the 11th. Uh, uh, we expect a quorum at this time. We have Mr. Wezar and myself, Bernard Parks, and I'm sitting in as a chair uh, because Mr. Garcetti is unavailable. What we'd like to start off is item one on the overview, and then we'll go to the one item on the agenda. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Jim Clark, Director of Federal Relations in the Mayor's Office. Uh, since we had our last meeting, which has been uh, several weeks ago, um, we've had a number of uh, grant opportunities that are coming forward to us in the month of, of uh, September. In fact, we have 15 uh, various grant opportunities that will uh, be coming up this month or that have already come up this month. Of those, three of those are, are ones that we've already applied for previously and, and brought them to your attention and, and had them go through the committee. Uh, I have one concern, though, uh, specifically about 11 of these pertain to energy grants related to the Department of Water and Power. Uh, on numerous occasions, both our office and uh, CAO's office have been in contact with the contacts of DWP to try to ascertain whether or not they are planning to pursue these grant opportunities, and we've been unsuccessful in getting any information from them about whether they're, they are, in fact, applying for these. Uh, this is a pattern that we've seen since the beginning of these, um, the, of the formation of this committee. Uh, in fact, we just learned the other day uh, that they previously applied for two grants under the Smart Grid Demonstration Project for $152 million. Uh, this figure kept varying between $182 million, $152 million, $200 million, because we couldn't get any actual information on paper from them. We just got uh, oral reports or emails from them. And in fact, it was changed uh, to $152 million uh, as of this morning. Um, this, as like I said, is a pattern that's, that's happened not just on, on one occasion. This is a, about the third time now that uh, DWP has gone ahead and submitted applications without coming either notifying the mayor's office, uh, the CAO's office, or this committee. And um, I think it's time that this committee call DWP forward to explain their, their conduct with respect to this. Are uh, they present today? What's that? Are they present today? No, they aren't. Okay. They are not present right. today. Let me just say this. Uh, there's two things I'd like to do is that from the committee is that we request the mayor direct the DWP commission to have that department comply with the directions previously articulated by this committee and the mayor's office as it relates to grants, and we'd ask that DWP be present at our next meeting. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, that's all I have to report. Okay. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Let me just ask one thing. Would it be better if we ask the commission or the general, ma general, manager? general manager to be yes. present? Good morning, Good morning. Uh, Mr. Parks, Mr. Wezar, Bill Kreitz with the CAO's office. Uh, just to give you some, an overview of some of the project management elements on the ARA project, uh, in the month of August, uh, while the council was on recess, uh, there, were, there was not too much activity in the way of new applications submitted. However, there were a few, and we have adjusted all of the dashboards and all the reports, which are now on the website. Um, and for those listening, uh, that website address, by the way, is larecovery.lacity.org, if they'd like to see those dashboards and reports, which are, uh, were updated yesterday. Um, so I wanted to bring that to your attention. Training sessions have been held by the CAO's office for departments in preparation for the October OMB reporting as well as for the CAO analysts who will be preparing reports to this committee uh, for uh, acceptance of ARA grant awards. And we should be seeing more of those in the coming months. In addition to that, I would like to also commend the controller's office. They have taken the initiative to, on August 31st, send out letters to each of the ARA grant, uh, the department heads for uh, departments who expect to receive and manage ARA funds to remind them of their responsibility for managing these funds and also to remind them of audit findings and corrective actions that they, those departments have had so that they can be prepared to properly manage ARA funds. So, uh, the, uh, so I would like to just bring that to your attention as well. Let me just ask you, you said that that's a directive has been sent or that we need to send one? Uh, no, that has been sent on sent. Aug okay. August 31st by the controller. Okay. And that, 
I might also say that that also reflects the fact that there has been a concerted effort by the mayor's office, by the council, by this committee, by the controller, by the CLA, by the CAO, and by the departments to be prepared for these ARA grant funds when they come in and to manage them efficiently and effectively. So there's been a lot of coordination between the different city entities who will be involved with ARA, and this just being one of the latest ones. Uh, also, uh, because of the October OMB report, which will be the first quarterly report, we did a dry run reporting by the departments uh, that was submitted to us in the mayor's office on September 4th. So we are evaluating those OMB reports right now with the intent to get back to those departments with any suggestions for improving those or any corrective action so that they will be prepared in October to properly report to the OMB on their projects. I might also add that the city is waiting to hear on the status of about $750 million in ARA grant applications. So we have that much out there with the federal government that are waiting to hear back. And we, that is sort of trickling in, if you will. Uh, finally, there have been three grants applied for since this committee last met on August 14th. We have a total of 135 projects that we've requested funding, ARA funding for, uh, for a total of $1.8 billion. That's as of today. We have uh, 70 grant awards for a total of $777 million that we've been awarded so far. And we are expecting, this may change, but we're expecting no grant applications to be submitted in the next week between this ad hoc committee and next. And that would conclude my presentation. Okay. In fact, we won't have a, this meeting in for two weeks, right? Because we're uh, that, down that, next that's week? That's right, that's right. Okay. You're off for League of Cities, I believe, okay. next week, right. yes, sir. Okay. So that would be two weeks? So, yes. All right. Very good. Uh, let me let the record reflect that Mr. Wesson is uh, present. Any questions on the presentation? Okay. Let's move to item one. Thank you very Thank much. You. Good morning. I'm Sally Richmond with the Housing Department. Uh, I'm going, well, we haven't planned this, but I was, unless the CLA wants to make a report first. No. no. Okay. So I'm just going to give a brief overview about the program, talk about the recommendations in our report except for the contract recommendations. Lassa will talk about the contractor recommendations and the RFP process, and then I can discuss the state grant uh, after that, if that uh, is okay with you. Thank you. So, um, as you know, we've made several presentations to this committee and the Ad Hoc Homelessness Committee um, over the past several months, since March. And um, the Homelessness uh, Prevention and Rapid Rehousing Grant was created by the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, ARA, in February. It's part of the stimulus package. The city was allocated $29 million um, by formula, which we applied for in May and it provides financial assistance and services to prevent very low income individuals and households from becoming homeless or help those who are homeless to become rapidly rehoused. And again, it can pay for financial assistance and services. And the priority, unlike most homeless programs of HUD, is not on the chronically homeless necessarily. It's on people who can be stabilized um, with a small amount and short-term assistance. Um, so there's been a lot of program design, a lot of consultation, a lot of thinking about how, are, how is this going to work. Uh, it's really a new concept in certain ways to Los Angeles, especially on this scale. And so we have all been working um, together very hard on designing something that makes sense for Los Angeles. Um, so um, LAHD, the Housing Department, is the lead agency for the city as the grantee. We are subcontracting with the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority, LASA, to carry out the entire program on our behalf. And the Housing Authority of the City of Los Angeles is also a key partner. They are handling the financial assistance for the rapid rehousing activities. Um, we have, uh, and you'll hear more about the program design. We have received and returned the grant agreement. We're preparing to draw down funds in the next month. 
Um, we're still figuring out the reporting mechanism. HUD is still kind of designing its database, uh, et cetera. So there's a lot of moving parts here. And uh, we're going to have all the contracts signed between LEHD and LASA, between LASA and all the contractors, including the Housing Authority, by the end of this month. So we've been working on a very short time frame uh, throughout. And we've um, so the recommendations we the housing uh, so we request that you authorize LASA to execute the contracts uh, that they are recommending in our report. Um, we are requesting um, some staff positions for the housing department, uh, an exempt project coordinator position. Um, we earlier in the summer received your approval for a project assistant, but now that we know more about the reporting requirements of the OMB and also of HUD, we realize uh, we really need to have a higher level staff person. Um, so we're, we changed that. We're also requesting a small, or smaller amount of funds to upgrade a current position that manages all of our LASA activities from a management analyst to, to a uh, exempt senior project coordinator position. That's about $9,000, $10,000 a year plus related costs from the grant to um, the existing position is already currently funded through consolidated plan in our budget. Um, and we are requesting that those be exempt from the managed hiring process. Um, we've been told that may not be possible, but the reality is, is that you know we have had a neighborhood stabilization program grant of 33 million since early this year, and we still have not been able to fill that one project assistant. And with furloughs and everything else, it's really difficult um, to manage all this new work on top of our other work. So it, it may be a lost cause in asking for it, but I'm just going to put it out there. Um, and then we also are requesting authority to sign and accept a new grant from the state if we get it. We applied on a very quick turnaround in early August for $1.6 um, for um, which I will discuss later in detail. We came to this committee about a month or so ago about that. And um, because we won't know until September 21st and have to, or later and have to return the, the agreement immediately to the state, so they, we have us under contract by September 30th, which is in the statute, um, or HUD's regulations. Uh, we want approval now to do that. We, don't, we won't have time to come back. So, and then we have a lot of different controller's instructions, which I don't need to go into in our report, that we're requesting approval of. And um, so that, that is what our recommendations are. And I think now, um, like Arnold of Lhasa is going to explain the RFP process and the contractor recommendations. Good morning, Council Members. I'm Mike Arnold, the Executive Director of uh, the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority. Uh, as Sally mentioned, there was quite a lot of time that was spent with a number of uh, the city agencies uh, and departments, as well as staff members of the Ad Hoc Committee on Homelessness, uh, to develop program outlines and program ideals uh, that was uh, codified and released in a request for proposals on July 8, 2009, requesting bids for three programs, uh, rapid rehousing, homeless prevention, and rapid rehousing vehicular outreach. The RFP was designed around some key City of Los Angeles objectives, and those objectives included the desire to be able to provide coverage for the entire city. Because these are new programs, innovation and program design, it's, uh, some of these are going to be challenges in terms of being able to achieve program effectiveness, uh, and that was a key consideration. Uh, the capacity of those um, who are proposing to achieve program outcomes, and basically that's avoiding homelessness through our prevention activities, and then rapidly house households who, with some temporary assistance, can be expected to stay stably housed after the period of assistance. Additionally, we wanted to, the ability to focus on particularly hard-hit areas, uh, hard hit by the economic downturn, or who happen to be in high need of a particular service. Proposal submissions were due to back to LASA on August 4th, and eight bidders submitted proposals. We received five proposals for rapid rehousing, one rapid rehousing vehicular outreach proposal, and two homeless prevention proposals. The proposals at LASA go through, through two levels of review. There's a threshold review to establish baseline qualifications of the bidder for participating in the process. And once they, they pass threshold, there's a quality review to develop program scores for ranking and award recommendations. All of the bids met threshold. Three of the rapid rehousing proposals met funding level scoring quality review and were able to provide coverage for the entire city of Los Angeles. 
the vehicular outreach program proposal met funding level scoring on quality review and was a multi-agency collaborative proposal and provided coverage again for the entire city. One homeless prevention program proposal met funding level scoring and was a multi-agency collaborative and again provided coverage for the entire city of Los Angeles. The quality review process included scoring in the following categories. We paid great attention to program design and geographic coverage. We looked for integration of the program with other programs and services because these programs can't stand alone, they can't be in silos, and they need to be able to refer clients who would not be eligible for this service into other services effectively. Organizational capacity to meet the needs of the program. These are new programs. Uh, there isn't a lot of uh, administrative dollars, as everyone knows, and the ability to actually deliver um, these programs was also an important consideration in that evaluation process. We also looked for financial financial stability and program efficiency and HMIS participation and past programmatic performance if they were already homeless providers. As a result of the quality of the review and the ability to provide full city coverage, the loss of Board of Commissioners approved programming awards and funding subject to City Council approval for the three rapid rehousing, one vehicular outreach and one homeless prevention program. As noted in the transmittal, we're recommending approval of these selected programs so we can begin negotiating contracting for services to begin October 1, 2009, or as soon as possible thereafter. The recommendations for contract awards are as follows. For rapid rehousing, we're recommending LA Family Housing serving the San Fernando Valley, people assisting the homeless or PATH serving from West Side to Hollywood through the downtown and east side of Los Angeles, and special services for groups serving south of Santa Monica Freeway, um, south of area adjacent to USC, south Los Angeles, Crenshaw, and south to the San Pedro areas. For the Rapid Rehousing Vehicular Outreach Program, we are re recommending award to the Vehicular Outreach Collaborative. People Assisting the Homeless is the lead agency. Collaborative partners in that particular proposal include Gateways Hospital and Mental Health Center, Weingart Center Association and St. Joseph Center. And on prevention, we're recommending the Los Angeles City Homeless Prevention Project, Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles serving as lead agency. Collaborative members of the Los Angeles City Homeless Prevention Project include uh, not only LAFLA as the lead agency, but Neighborhood Legal Services of Los Angeles County, with case management being provided by New Economics for Women, and Inner City Law Center, where LAMP community will be providing case management. Uh, one of the fundamental aspects of that program will be careful coordination um, with all uh, of Los Angeles, including, of course, the Apartment Association of Greater, Greater Los Angeles, to ensure that those benefits are aware and uh, made available to uh, the broadest possible population. I also want to point out that while the transmittal may indicate uh, a somewhat prescriptive amount in those contracts, our contracts are being established to be extremely flexible to allow for funding to be moved from one contractor to another to redistribute as necessary to achieve our program outcomes. We're going to be monitoring our program utilization and assistance payments carefully and we'll have contract provisions which allow us the ability to move funding from low utilizing programs to higher utilizing programs to ensure we match the funding with the need. This is particularly important where we have three separate agencies providing rapid rehousing services. Additionally, we're going to be closely monitoring our collaborative multi-agency programs to ensure the lead agency is matching funding to need within the collaborative throughout the city. Uh, there are representatives of the um, contracting agencies if there are any questions relative to their programs um, or them as an agency, too. Okay. Let me, let me start off, and I think most of us are familiar with uh, most of those agencies. They've been around. Let me just ask uh, a couple of questions as it relates to uh, uh, the breakdown of the funding. Uh, when I looked at the, the breakdown on the federal program versus the state, they both have uh, administrative costs, and I, I assume data collection dollars for both grants. I, I wanted to know whether those, because uh, we have about, if I read it correctly, 1.4 million in the federal and about uh, a portion of the 194,000 in the state. Is that the same data they're collecting? Can it be shared? Do we have to have two separate administrative and 
data collection operations to address these two grants? Uh, this is Sally Richmond from the Housing Department. The, um, the data collection line item is really the way that we could pay for a staff person at the city, uh, at the Housing Department, because the administrative funds for the state grant, if we get it, are $16,000. Uh, so um, there is different data. All of the programs, the contractors will be entering data into the homeless management information system, which is managed by LASA. Um, we do have separate reporting requirements. There will be different reports to the state, to OMB, potentially to HUD eSNAPs. We do not yet know what the state reporting requirements are, but they, as a grantee, just like the city is, will have to do the same kind of reporting. So, but, so but these positions we're hiring, the senior and the project manager, they're going to be managing both if we're successful with the state? Or is that another group of people? It'll be the same group of people. Okay. So they, so is there a commingling of d data? Um, it's, well, it'll be different data because they're different programs. Mm -hmm. The staff will be uh, assigned to work on the, the project coordinator, for example, will be um, the senior project coordinator oversees a lot of things, mm -hmm. not only this program. So only $9,000 a year plus related costs is going for his work on this. He may be spending more than 10% uh, of his time on the program, um, so it's flexible in that way. Okay. Uh, it's one small work unit in the housing department, so people will be doing whatever it is, is needs uh, to be done to get these grants running. So we're not duplicating positions. We did request some student professional workers for the state grant if we get it. Um, we will see what the workload is. We're just very concerned because reporting is more onerous than it was. Okay. So, um, Is the difference between the federal and the state is that if the state has a more chronic population that you're looking at? Yes, the state, uh, contrary to HUD's guidance, actually had very um, required us to work more with chronically homeless folks, and that is why we came up with the concept, program concept, to enable people to move into or stay in uh, permanent supportive housing as a key part of the program. They, uh, they had a lower income. They required for scoring, because it was a competitive process, that we serve a variety of high-risk groups. Uh, now, with HUD, our direct grant was an entitlement, so we could propose as long as we're in accordance with the guidelines. So that, that's where the program concept came in, that we would, um, that some of the funds would go for stabilization services to folks moving into new developments, like new, uh, new Carver, the, the Cobb apartments, and so forth. Okay. But, I mean, if we made a distinction between the two, this, so I understand that the state is a more chronic population. It's a more chronic population and it's very focused. Um, mm -hmm. It's uh, to small groups as well as the housing authority, folks who uh, may need to move uh, because the Section 8 payment standard is going to go down and also people who are on Section 8's benefits are being cut um, by because of state cutbacks. So it's a number um, I think the Housing Authority has spoken to its commission about this. That they are going to be uh, reducing the amount that they can pay to owners, and therefore some owners are not going to accept that reduction. People will be forced to move, and those who are high risk of becoming homeless because they don't have savings for first and last month of security deposit, this, the state grant will provide funds for those security deposits so that people can find another apartment to move into. I understand from HACLA there is a large interest in the apartment owner community about Section 8 because of the economy. So that's, that's the good news about yeah. that. But folks will need assistance to move. Could a client get services from both grants or is it separated to where each grant supports them totally or do they get services from both? No, they'll be totally separate grants. Totally separate. Okay. And then the other thing on the positions that we're asking for, uh, on one position is currently funded by block grant money, and yeah. so it fits in that we're upgrading it. The other one where we're holding a position management assistant, is that general fund money or is that also grant? No, that's um, that MA2 position right now is the person and on our staff who handles all of the LASA contracts with the city. Okay, so that's, that's currently funded through the consolidated plan. Okay, so that's also grant. Cause, okay, yes. cause it, there's no yeah. distinction there. Mr. Rosselli, you have yes, uh, First of all, I'm absolutely delighted 
uh, to see how quickly you all moved on these issues uh, with the federal government for stimulus money. Uh, this is a beautiful new moment for me to see that we're actually able to go forward with projects that we know are vital for our people. So God bless you all for that, first point. Second is um, the uh, amount of money I just see for this is 500000 to St. Joseph Center. Is that sort of the figure I'm hearing? What has been set aside is $500,000 for the vehicular outreach program. And mm -hmm. St. Joseph Center is a participant, is it one of the collaboratives? So mm -hmm. part of our challenge is covering the city. The other part is making sure that we have resources available to those areas that we know, like the beach cities, that have a particular concentration of that need. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned earlier that October would be when you would hope to get this money into the system? That's when we're, that's what we're pushing for, yes. Okay, let's take that then and say timetable. Uh, on the St. Joseph Center for the moment. Uh, I get that money, and then what is the time frame to do things, and who are they accountable to, and how do we know that they're moving in the direction that we obviously consider important? Well, PATH is going to serve as the lead agency in that program, and they're sort of facilitating the broad coverage, and then St. Joseph's is a partner with them in that process. So PATH is, is ultimately responsible for the rapid implementation of this and working closely with St. Joseph. Of course, we're going to be pay paying very close attention because we also have an incentive to get the money out and get it spent as rapidly as we can and get folks into housing. So we'll be paying a lot of attention to that whole process as well. And we'll be coming back to you with quarterly reports in terms of um, number of encounters, number of successful housing, uh, and, and the like. Okay. And um, if I may say, sure. as, as soon as the contractor recommendations are approved today, then the agencies can move forward, put out job notices, start hiring and training people, because almost all of, I mean, a, a number of new jobs are being created because of this grant, which means uh, the agencies are using existing staff but also hiring new. So there is some time lag there between when services can be. We assume that by November um, everything will be up and running, but October uh, it's unclear. I mean, we will be getting things going and getting the money flowing, but when they actually open the door for services, um, I think that's, that's part of the negotiation. For I the appreciate contract. that. Is somebody from PATH here today? Uh, could you come up, please? Uh, my question for PATH is going to be a strategy question. Uh, in Venice itself, uh, there's a tremendous energy and interest uh, in the issue of people living in cars and campers. Uh, there's the good, the bad, and the ugly discussion. Uh, and uh, I want to form a citizens committee that interfaces with the St. Joseph Center and interfaces with PATH so that the energy is, is a cooperative energy in Venice. There's tremendous conflict and, and negativity going on, and I want to diffuse that immediately. Uh, Path, what I'd like to ask you, and thank you so much for getting engaged in this issue, and you're a great group, you've got a great track record, and, and, and I'm very grateful that you're taking a lead on this, and I'm also grateful. St. Joseph Center here? Yes. Oh, Joseph terrific. Uh, uh, just respond to me on how Path and St. Joseph Center see yourselves moving on this issue. Yeah, sure. Um, well, good morning. My name is Rudy Salinas, and I am the Director of Outreach for PATH, People Assisting the Homeless. Uh, presently, uh, the thing that we have going on in that community near Westchester, near Venice, is that we have an outreach team that has been uh, linking itself to folks that we have been running into that have been living in cars, that we have seen as recent homeless, folks that have not been homeless for a very long time. What we have in plan and what we actually have been working on in preparation for this is to build collectively with not just the representatives from St. Joseph's Center who will be joining us collectively to work as a team to engage these folks, but also some existing resources that we have already been working with, such as the Department of Mental Health and different groups that help us engage these persons that we see living in the cars. I don't know if this answers the question, Council Member, but we do have a good collection. St. Joseph Center, would you respond yes. as well? Yes. Um, as you know, we've had interactions with people living in vehicles in Venice for a long, long time yeah. through our, our normal outreach. And we're really happy that we're able to collaborate with PATH in this because it sees, sees a, see, we see it as a way that we can really have some dedicated time to work with people living in vehicles to find out who they are, how many of them there are, where they are, and what their needs are, and to do what we can to connect them uh, with permanent housing. Good. Here's what my plan is then. Uh, today is, uh, what, the 12th of... Uh, 11th. 11th. 
September. The 11th, see? I'm already a day ahead. All right, it's the 11th of September. Uh, before September is over, uh, I want to have a meeting in the district uh, in Venice that brings together a collection of community people uh, that are sensitive to this issue. There's some who have one opinion, some who have another's, and then there's some in between. And in that public forum, uh, I'd like you to make a full-blown presentation of how PATH operates, what it's been doing, and then St. Joseph Center to do the same. Uh, and then talk about your visions of how you see that money spent and, and what you feel it, it will accomplish. At the same time, it gives the community a chance to interact. This is community money. This isn't strange money. This is our tax dollars coming back uh, to programs. So everybody feels a sense of responsibility for that. And when you outline the program, uh, hopefully the volunteers in the room, there are a lot of them, want to be engaged in this issue in a very positive way, can work with you on that. St. Joseph Center's reputation in some circles, like mine, is stellar. In other circles, it's not. And that's because the issue itself is so uh, difficult for people to appreciate and have to deal with. So it will also be a plus for the St. Joseph Center to have it. What I'm proposing is we hold the meeting at the St. Joseph Center. You have a nice room there. And we do a, the proper outreach uh, that brings the elements of the community that should get into a consensus mode on this issue into the room, and you outline this plan. Yeah. Well, we're very aware about the different you know, factors in the community and the conversations that are going on there. And, you know, we've been part of those discussions. And, you know, we're happy to have the opportunity. And we know that we, we get associated with the homeless issues. So where people come down on that is it has to do with how they think about us. So unfortunately, we wish that it we're not exactly that way, but sometimes that happens. Yeah, and, and La said, I mean, I, will Santa Monica be part of this? And Santa Monica is in the heart of my district, and the, the homeless move back and forth, and people in cars and vehicles move back and forth. Are they getting extra or similar stimulus money? Where are they on this particular issue? They are getting um, stimulus money, and they are going to be distributing that through their, um, I believe, housing department or uh, within the city itself. So they've got they've got a different program. I don't know if uh, they have uh, identified vehicular outreach as a target, though. Yeah, well, that's because they've uh, said they can't have their vehicles in Santa Monica. Yeah. Like everybody else has said, <laughs> uh, except for us. We've been granted the, uh, from the city of Santa Monica, has awarded St. Joseph Center their uh, rapid rehousing uh, grant. So we're going to be working with the city of Santa Monica on that. Well, I, I'm very, very, very happy about this moment here. Arturo Pena is my key player, obviously, for Venice. Get with him. Get some planning going. Let's announce we're going to have a community meeting in a couple of weeks, assuming my colleagues uh, approve this today, and it's just a matter of getting that money in. Because when October hits, I want to hit the ground running. I want people to be participating in this program uh, in a volunteer way where they can, so that it isn't just the money aspect that spurs it, but the energy of the people involved in the community. And I think we can become a model. Uh, for the nation, because Venice is a high-profile city, uh, that if we can be successful in working on this, it will, it will send a message uh, to the rest of the world that we really are doing something positive. I've been mouthing this for a few months, and I was hoping this would happen, uh, and I'm very grateful that we're at this point right now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. I have a, a quick question on these are grants, and has some thought or analysis been done to determine what long-term cost the city will incur uh, if these grants should all be come in and um, if they should all come in. Sally Richmond from the Housing Department. Um, well, there are no long-term costs. It's three years. Spend the money. What you don't spend, HUD takes back. Um, that's why the positions we've requested are temporary, exempt, uh, maximum three-year okay. type positions. Uh, the one person we're asking the pay upgrade for is already a current staff person. There's just a temporary increase due to the increased responsibilities. So what um, the lessons learned from this program, I think, will influence going forward how LASA and the city implement housing pro uh, homelessness uh, service programs mm -hmm. in the city. Great. Thank you. And it also applies to other grant programs that we receive where we implement permanent infrastructure to execute those grants, and we end up uh, having these long-term costs that we didn't anticipate with that, the actual funding continuing to come in for to execute that service. So thank you. 
Let me just uh, ask on uh, to one request, and then I'd ask the CLA to give their uh, amending motion. But uh, I'd like to have a report back uh, to the committee uh, on uh, the current federal grant to give us a more specific breakdown on the administrative cost. And then if we're successful in the state grant to get a specific breakdown of the uh, data collection and program administration, it's rough, just under 200000 On the federal grant, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of $3 million. So we'd ask for a report back on that. Uh, let me just find out. Is Mr. Weston still? Is, yeah, see if he's there. Otherwise, we're going to move that. Well, Mr. Weston's uh, being located. If you could just give us the, your uh, uh, amendment. Yes, sir. Meg Barclay with the CLA. Uh, we have a number of recommended amendments, um, a couple of technical ones to ensure that the personnel department is involved in the review and uh, filling the new positions or um, requested by the LAHD and specifying that the existing grant or management analyst two position is a, is a grant funded position and would remain so. Um, we recommend the, uh, that would be amendments to um, replacement recommendations, excuse me, to recommendations 1B and 1C in the LAHD and losses report. We also recommend uh, deleting recommendations 1D. 1D is addressed in the revised recommendations to 1B and 1C, and also um, deleting the recommendation 1E relative to the authority to hire student workers because that was actually provided to the department in the city budget, so it's, it's a redundant request. And then we have an additional recommendation to um, instruct the housing department and LASA regard to report at the time of the first quarterly status report regarding the homelessness prevention program based on some concerns with because this is a new program in the city and we haven't done this before to provide some specific data regarding the regional distribution of the homeless prevention clients and services, an assessment of the capacity of the homeless prevention contractor and subcontractors to efficiently respond to service demand and then provide any recommendations for additional subcontractors to address any um, regional gaps in service or capacity deficiencies that might be identified as a result of that report. Okay. And I provided this language to the clerk. Thank you very much. Uh, if there's no other questions, we have no public comment. Uh, we'll move that item as amended. And, and Mr. Arnold, uh, don't forget your promise that we're going to get the apartment association involved, uh, and they're, they're waiting for your call. Thank well, you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. So that's the uh, only item for today, and so this meeting's adjourned.